Hi, welcome to Messier Mantra. I'm your host, Mike Messier, with our guest, film director, Brandon LaFleur. Hey, Brandon. Hello. Good to see you again. And uh, we were talking last time, and you're, you're actually still a pretty, pretty young guy when it comes to, but you've made you know three or four or four films already, but you're enrolled at University of Rhode Island in the film studies department, is that correct? Or film, is it film studies and production, or how does that work? Or so that? they call it film media. Okay. And it's through the Harrington School of Communication and Media. Uh, we just actually opened up a new building called Ranger Hall, so that's like the film-centric building. Uh, amazing place. We got a quite up-to-date technology. Nice. Super good stuff. Uh, but we operate as film media, which many of the courses, uh, you can choose your own path really, but a lot of the courses uh, give you the opportunity to either direct one project or work on two other projects. So Interesting. You could you can maybe write for one and then key grip for another or do sound for one and, and uh, I don't know, assistant camera for another. It really allows you to explore a lot of the positions that there are in the, uh, the film world. Nice. And it's Keith Brown, is this gentleman's name? The, uh, the head of the department or is Keith? Uh, <clears throat> the, the head of the department, uh, no. But he is one of the uh, more involved production professors. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he runs a lot of the upper level classes, so there's like advanced production, and then there's the senior seminar in film media, and then various other uh, courses. So in the past few years, we've worked with like we've done client media production, where we do companies for or commercials for local companies. Excuse me. Uh, there was another one uh, where we exclusively work on films rather than uh, rather than doing digital. Okay. So, oh wow. Yeah. So Thirty five millimeter sixteen or something. Yeah. Challenging. Yeah. Challenging. Yeah. The editing. I mean, can you imagine when they were editing, say, you know, Citizen Kane, you know, fifty, sixty years ago? The uh, the challenges in something like that, more than fifty or sixty years ago, but yeah. just the challenges in the film stock because it's so uh, temperamental or so valuable each frame yeah no mistakes that's you know? that is terrifying to me right and there are i mean there are amazing auteurs that will never switch over to to digital and i i think christopher nolan uh with dunkirk right didn't he shoot on film i i believe you i'll I look into so. that okay yeah. i I've hope been, that, have you I seen it yet true. i've been meaning to see that one. i haven't seen dunkirk yet that's yeah. my plan this weekend just started yeah it just came out yeah. but uh man you have to be a perfectionist to work on film right. i can't imagine because you send that stock out to get to get developed, and if it comes back terrible, you you got to reshoot. Right. Which is that's scary to me. And, and the great thing about URI is that you get access to a lot of amazing equipment. So in terms of cameras, like we have the Sony A7S, we have the Blackmagic Cinema camera. Yep. So I, one of the things that I love about going to film school is having the access to this stuff, absolutely free, covered by tuition. Right. And, and it gives you the opportunity to explore what's right for you. That's right cool. now, for me, that's the Sony A7S. It just it looks fantastic. And the very last film that we saw in the prior episode, Flickr, we shot on the Sony A7S. That was it. It, it just it feels very professional. Yes. And it's very redeeming to have that type of quality. Right, right, right. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting. The uh, the technology advances so quickly, and at the same time, you still need to you still need to have know. At the end of the day, you need human beings who know how to run the equipment. Yes. Or have what I would call an eye, what they call an eye, a DP with an eye, an editor with good timing, like we talked about your last piece with the comedic timing of the editing. All of the human factors, I hope they stay around as long as possible. You know, I was watching some, I think Werner Herzog is doing a documentary on the internet and the technologies of the last 20 or 30 years. And Lo just, and behold. Right. Have you, I, I don't know if it's come out yet, but I saw a preview of it. And, uh, uh, I don't know if it's out on DVD. I, it, was like, it was around for a week at the Cable Card in oh, Providence, okay. Rhode Island. Okay. So I was able to see it there. Yeah, but one, one quote in just the preview alone was, was, was riveting already, which is uh, someone was speculating that there'll be a time when machines make films, you know, and without the human being involved at all. I mean, now with CGI and special effects and so forth, you know, you can say a filmmaker also has those tools, but do we want to get to the point where the tools are making the film and we have nothing to do with it other than to watch? I don't know if we want to get to that point. Will a film feel as intimate without human condition involved in it? I don't know. I, I hope not. I can't, like, 
I know there is artificial intelligence that's told short stories. Right. But I don't think that we could, we as humans could be engaged in a story entirely made by artificial intelligence. We'd, we'd look at it and we'd say something's missing here. Something's missing here and, um, you know, where do we send our residual checks to, you know? <laughs> you know, but I mean, they've done things. I mean, uh, you know, I remember in chess, Kasparov was playing Deep Blue or whatever, the computer uh, stimulated chess opponent. And it, it, it does seem like we get to that point of a uh, dangerous position. But um, let's talk uh, about your film school experience. Overall, it seems it's been very good for you. I have found it to be a very rewarding experience. Yeah. Um, I would, in, a lot of people tell me that you should just go right into the industry, but I would endorse film school 100%. Maybe, maybe not go out to California where it costs like $50,000 a year. Sure. I don't know, but uh, to, to go to film school, it's an opportunity to, to network with the up and comers. Right. It's, it's an opportunity to figure out what you really want to do uh, in, in a learn learning community uh, before you go out and obviously learn from your mistakes right yeah what do people because because as a pretty young guy um, how do younger people these days um, appreciate film do they st do people your your age you're uh, 21 do you still go to the movies like you do but do your friends like if you say hey I want to go see Dunkirk this weekend is it a struggle for you to get people to go with you, or are people still into going to the cinema? They oh, I'll just catch it on Netflix uh, or whatever. I mean, people that you know, uh, are they still into the movie-going experience at the actual theater, or is it more of a wait till it comes on video, or I'll just bootleg it off of the internet, or you know what I mean? Well, in the film media department, that's an easy answer. We sure. we we of course go to the theater. There's something, there's something about the theatrical experience, you know, the smell of popcorn, the, the, the slight coldness of the theater. Sure, and just, 68 and 72 degrees. Yeah. That's the, 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 right. All the lights down, the huge screen, it's being projected as it should be. Right. I mean, Dunkirk, for example, that was shot on 70 millimeter, and that wouldn't be the same on my television. It's, right. <laughs> I got a 32-inch TV. It wouldn't be the same experience. Sure. Uh, so I, I hope the theater doesn't die. I, I mean, I'm thankful for Netflix because it, it's made it easier for a lot of artists to to put their work out. Like I, I know Tom DiNucci puts a lot of uh, a lot of his work onto Netflix, and yes, it makes it a lot easier for distribution. But there's still a place for major theaters. Right. There really is. Well, I'm glad you hear hear you say that <laughs> because I think that's that was a concern for people when. The TV came out, 19, you know, 40s or 50s was. Oh, are we gonna get rid of movie? You know, and then so the, the there's a there's always been a game of the movie theater doing something to keep people coming, and it's always seemed to work so far, which is good. Yeah. You know, um, because it's like if you don't have that key brick of the movie theater experience, then I think some of this other stuff, that's kind of like the big thing, you know. So I'm glad to hear you say that people are still going to movies. Anything you've seen recently that caught your attention that you really enjoyed? Uh, I saw Woody Harrelson's Wilson. Okay. Uh, very independent. It didn't get widely released, but I saw it at a at a showcase, and it's just it's about this it's about this character named Wilson, played by Woody Harrelson, who gets very uncomfortably close with people. Right, right. Like he just he doesn't know when it's inappropriate to say something out loud, so it's like whatever he thinks, he just says it, and then. He finds out that he has a daughter with a prior lover, and he just takes the worst possible route to go and find her. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's it was just it was such a fun ride. Nice. You know that that's what I'm I'm into a lot of the independent films, so that was a fun one. Uh, coming out soon, Brigsby Bear from okay. Kyle Mooney. It's about uh, well Kyle Mooney's character was abducted as a child, and then the people that kept him produced a television series called Brigsby Bear that he watched throughout his entire life and then only to find out that the the show's not a real show and it was made by them so he goes off once he's finally saved and taken back into the into public life he goes off to try to make his own Brigsby Bear wow that just i mean that looks fantastic i, I like that mix of 
absurdist comedy with something that, that like traumatizing drama. Right. So I'm, I haven't seen it yet. It's coming out very soon, but I'm looking forward to it. Well, speaking of, of what you just said, kind of will lead me to show clips of your own work, which we, for those that watch our previous episode, we'll, we'll see them again. But for those who haven't, let's check out some of your clips, Brandon, uh, right here on Messier Mantra. All right. I want you to think about something. You're 10 now. I wonder where you'll be when you're 20. I don't know. Now think about it. You'll be in college. You'll be off doing great things. I wonder where those things will be. I've never thought of that. Really? I always thought I'd be here with you. Oh, honey, you don't have to stay here just for me. I want to. You won't be saying that when you're 20. Happy birthday to me. Let's all bow our heads for a moment of reflection for Ruth. Thank you. Ruth was an exemplary mom. She was a nurse for over 40 years. She was an amazing caregiver. I was never the healthiest kid, but she always knew how to take care of me. And I'll never forget her for that. Goodbye, Mom. Please, watch this. Jackson Insurance and you. You've just started work at Jackson Insurance. Good for you. At Jackson Insurance, you do the work so that we don't have to. What's this? A phone call? You'll be getting a lot of these at Jackson Insurance. Hello? Why, Darlene, my beautiful wife. Uh-oh, a personal phone call. You know what that means. Well, I guess you should have saved that phone call until after work. Sorry, Roger. To avoid becoming a Roger, follow these three steps. That's all for now. Now get back to work. Do you understand now? That was me! Oh. Uh, did you see yourself in the events that just occurred on the office training video? Hmm? Uh-huh. Uh. I think you know what to do with this. Sam, talk to me. Easy? What about this is easy? Okay. Uh, perhaps it was the wrong choice of words. None of this is easy. I've known about the shit you were pulling for years, and I kept it secret for years because you begged me. And you too want to tell me it's easy? None of this is easy, Sam. I am 70 years old. I have spent more than 40 years with your mother, and all that time, something didn't feel right. This is that feeling, Sam. Decades of, of, of this.
Hello? Sonny, very sorry. Gonna have to cancel today. I had another appointment. Tomorrow all right? Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow's all right. Thanks. Welcome back to Messier Mancha with our guest, Brandon Lafleur. Brandon, um, I just had a couple of thoughts. In, in your uh, the funeral scene, um, or the memorial service scene, I should say, to clarify, with uh, the actor uh, Jack Shipley's his name, right? He's, yep. he's doing a tribute to uh, his mom. And I, I, I caught something that I haven't caught in a lot of um, independent films, uh, even my own, really. It was You had a really good shot of what we would call, you know, background actors. And there was a really good moment where one of the background actors, I think a, a woman in kind of a black dress, she had like a really nice emotional um, state of mind on her face, which is actually, to your credit as a director and to whoever that actress was, uh, quite quite good because it's it's hard sometimes to get background actors to really get emotionally invested in the project, but it seems like you, caught something there with her. Is, is there anything you, you remember about that particular shot that you want to talk about? I do. It was an action, re all we did was an action rehearsal and we ran on the action rehearsal. Um, she was listening to Jack and, and how he was giving the eulogy and and just, <laughs> she just sort of, she started crying. Wow. Yeah, so that, I mean, that, I think that's a testament to, to Jack's skills as an actor and how he was able to work with the dialogue. Uh, but that just it gave everybody chills. Right. It was a that was an intense that was an intense moment. And to the young lady herself, I don't even know her name. If, if, if you do the actress that I'm talking about, but she, to her credit too, because it, it's it did lend itself to emotional gravity to the scene, you know. Yeah. And from what I remember, in Nana, she wasn't a main character, but just just her moment there was pretty pretty good. And like I said, in a lot of films, even mainstream films that'll go to the cinema. You take it for granted that background actors uh, have much to do with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But they can. They, I mean, like and it's just, just evidence. And then in the um, the scene, I still love that scene, the training video within the training video. Um, what I found interesting was the positioning of the water cooler behind uh, Jack's character, which is always that you know the water cooler talk, or you know you have the bubbler, or whatever you want to call it, you know, and with the little Dixie cups. The worst is those triangle cups that you can't even put any. What are you supposed to say? It's one sip and throw it away. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But the fact that like he poofs and then the the water cooler just happens to be positioned right behind him was that a, a happy accident or was that something that you planned out? That's a happy accident. One hundred percent. Yeah. But water cooler talk, you you'd think that he'd be allowed to sort of be a little looser in the office if they're having water cooler talk, but nope, he gets fired. <laughs> right, and then the, the boss, the way that he says, the boss delivers his lines, very funny, I thought, with uh, the training video. Like, he yeah. says the words, the training video so slowly that there's, that there's, if you were to read that line on the script, it wouldn't necessarily be funny, but the way he delivers it, your training video, like he, he just says it in a very, Funny kind of cryptic way, like Pet Cemetery or something. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I had him think about Office Space. Or actually, right. I had him walk to Office Space the day before because uh, Bill Lombard. Yeah, yeah. Just so uh, he's just like so ipso facto. Let me drink my coffee and tell you what to do. Like, right, right. Was that yeah. the character that's always getting uh, inquisition by the two you know, Office uh, Inquisitors? Is what I remember from that movie. They're always in, you know taking people into these interviews and. I don't, I don't like my flair and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Um, what were some uh, comedic influences, or dramatic, or both, more influences on, on your work as you're developing your style, so to speak? Uh, comedically speaking, Mike Judge. Okay. Yeah, so but was that Beavis and Butthead, the artist? Beavis and Butthead, right. uh, Office Space, Extract, King yep. of the Hill. Yep. I just, uh, it, a lot of the stuff that he makes feels very real, but then he mixes in some, some great absurdity. Right. Especially with extract. Uh, well, especially with office space as well. I don't want to give too much away on office space, but there is a, they devise a code to take a percentage of uh, some of the income that the company's making, but they accidentally move the decimal place over and steal hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> right, 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 uh, right. So they're just, they're just trying to make a quick buck, but then they end up like, t everything just goes downhill so quickly. Yeah. Which is, that's just hilarious to me. Yeah. And uh, you just see, I think he makes things that are very real. Right. Uh, 
and uh, I admire that a lot. The aggravation of the everyday man will never go out of style. You know, I, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, like, I remember um, the Blondie sandwich. What was, was it? Uh, Dagwood and Blondie? I don't know if you remember that. That was a co way, way, way back. Just, just, just a guy whose whole freedom in life was just have a sandwich. You know, because his, <laughs> his life was so miserable. And this was just a comic strip, you know, but I mean, he, he would get excited about the sandwich. Uh, because uh, Dagwood was just a miserable, you know, a guy who's just living life and had yeah. the pretty wife, but his whole thing was just to have a sandwich. <laughs> you know? um, That's the thing I've noticed. It's the little things, you know. Even in even in Nana, which was a dramatic piece, it was just the the relationship between the grandmother and the grandson revolved around chocolate chip cookies. Right. You know, and that's a very warm thing. I, I know that I I'm 21, but I still love pulling some cookies out of the oven. Yeah. You know, it's just it's great. Yeah. And I I think that just it's a good metaphor for for love and warmth and 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 happiness, you know. The 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 Nana thing to me is interesting because just today I was uh I borrowed from the library. Imagine that, still going to the library. But I went <laughs> to the library, not not Amazon or eBay, but went, got the Bruce Springsteen's uh, Born to Run audio CD. It's his biography, 16 CDs of, you know, the boss Bruce Springsteen. And it's I'm on basically like five minutes into it. It's already emotionally packed. And he was raised uh, in a house where his aunt died at age six, got hit by a truck on her tricycle. And, the, you know, he never met his aunt because she was already long, long gone. But mm -hmm. they had this painting of the aunt in the family house that just kind of loomed over them all the time. Because, like, in the living room where the grandma is and his parents, there's this portrait of the aunt which he didn't realize it at the time, but what it reinforced is we could all go at any day, any minute. Absolutely. You know, and then the sweetest picture of innocence, you know, the six-year-old aunt who was killed by this truck, and it was just looming over him as this constant reminder. And uh, the other part of it was he was raised by a grandmother who saw him as the substitute for her dead daughter. Mm -hmm. his, his dead daughter, uh, his dead aunt, Virginia, the grandma saw Springsteen, as kind of the reincarnation or the second chance to be the smothering, overwhelming uh, mother figure. And she wouldn't even let his own parents really raise him because she swooped in on him. And he said that he was like a little tyrant in the house who was in, you know, so just that relationship, much darker than that Springsteen had the Nana, you know. But it's just interesting that, that I would listen to that coming up here to talk to you today about your films. Yeah. And the human relationship, what I, I like about your work, um, is just that you're really exploring kind of the nuances and the details of all the different combinations, uh, the neighbor and the, and the wife, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a nightmare for a lot of guys. Like, I've, I've worked so hard to have a wife in a house, but now my neighbor's coming over uh, to, to do things with my wife, and isn't that the scariest nightmare you can have? It's like a comedic Twilight Zone. Right, right, right. And, and one, one thing that was also funny was I think, I think the wife, uh, which we didn't see in the clips, but uh, the wife voice was, was kind of done by yourself, right? That was me. <laughs> which, which I was watching that, and I was, I was thinking, like, okay, so maybe we get some actress to do But I was thinking, nah, it's kind of it's part of the fun. Like, it's, part of the absurdity of this piece is that the voice is this, you know, kind of Edith Bunker-esque voice of the wife kind of heckling the guy, yeah. you know? Like who? I I can't imagine having that phone call. It's just like, hey, Roger, <laughs> neighbor came over, gonna help him. <laughs> that's just that's traumatizing. Yeah. But like, he treats it like it's everyday life, and that's where the absurdity comes in. It's like, because she's definitely done it before. If she's calling him now. Right. I mean, we see things on TV all the time about, you know, and it's the what comes to mind is how much do you tolerate, you know, as a person. Exactly. How much do we tolerate of our respect being infringed upon her? And we're always told to forgive and always told to look the other way. Or to, and I was thinking about this uh, today. Don't pass judgment. Why shouldn't we pass judgment? You know, I mean, if you think about it. Um, what are some things that you want to do with your film work in the next 60, 70 years that you have to make films? What do, you, do you have any big projects you want to talk about as a little foreshadowing for your career? Uh, nothing big that I want to get too much into. Okay. Uh, I'm, right now I'm working on another short, uh, 
don't want to give away too much, but uh, it's going to be called Barnaby, and it is uh, it's again a video uh, a film coping with grief about a a son who is sort of regressing to a childlike state after the death of his mother. So uh, and and then the father who is trying to uh, to move on like the mother would have wanted. Uh, so that'll that'll be my next project. Um, I would like to continue with with dramatic pieces, you know, and I, I think that you can sprinkle a little bit of comedy as as a form of relief into dramatic pieces. But but that's sort of where I see my mind right now. Do you have uh, a YouTube channel or a website? Anything that for people that have seen some of these clips and might want to see your whole short films or or get in touch with you? Any way for the audience to reach you or reach out to you? Um, Working on a website, okay. so I'll give you the name of it. It's going to be LaFleurCreatives.com, okay. and that should be up within the next month. But that, I'll have a demo reel up there. I'll have some of the uh, projects that I've worked on that are available publicly up there, and uh, so people will be able to check out my stuff. Nice. Say that yeah. one more time for everybody. LaFleurCreatives.com. Great, great. Well, I make sure they got it. <laughs> make sure they got it, buddy. <laughs> you know, so I'm very excited for your career because it seems like you've got a point of view which is so important and you can write your own scripts and, and get the actors together and uh, like you said uh, we're just literally running out of time again but you've worked with you know six or seven of the same essential actors but I think they're doing very well by you yeah. like you have a good team I'm testing a theory called collaborative competency uh, doesn't the theory doesn't exist and probably can't be proven <laughs> but it's the idea that the longer you work with someone the more they will understand you Right. All right. Uh, and I, I'm not against working with new people. I go on New England Film all the time, putting out casting calls. But when when you work with someone that you know well and they know you well, they'll be more honest with you if you if they're not going to try to 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 suck up to you. Right. Really, which which I definitely don't want, especially this early in my career. But uh, the great thing is, like Mark Davies, for an example, I had him as Jack Jackson in an office phone call, and then I had him in a. Uh, in an older affair, and and he was very honest when he said, uh, "This this doesn't read re real. What if I say this instead?" And I was like, "That's perfect. Thank you." Right? Not all actors are going to do that. Well, Brandon, I want to thank you for coming on Messier Mantra. We run out of time. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for watching Messier Mantra.